so excited for you. You have just made the choice to tune into this event today and take this time to invest in yourself. And I can guarantee you, you are gonna walk away with some tangible advice that will help you to improve your life. I have been a big fan of Greg McEwen ever since I read his first book, Essentialism, and we had him at the speaker series seven years ago. Who was here for that? Put it in the chat if you were, I'd love to see. When his book came out, or when his new book came out, Effortless, I knew that we had to have him back at LinkedIn to just enlighten us with some more. I thoroughly enjoyed this book and you know what impacted me the most was the reminder that life does not have to be so hard. There will be hard times for sure. And as we all know, there have definitely been a lot of those recently. Times where we're stressed, exhausted, lost, confused, upset, scared, hurt, all the things. Um, but it's all a part of the process. And when facing a difficult situation, Greg reminds us that we can always ask ourselves, how can I make this easy? Do I choose the heavier or the lighter path? And in this book, Greg says, and I love this quote, I wanna read it. Whatever has happened to you in life, whatever hardship, whatever pain, they pale in comparison to the power you have to choose what to do now. I'm gonna read it one more time. Whatever has happened to you in life, whatever hardship, whatever pain, they pale in comparison to the power that you have to choose what to do now. He shares a very moving personal example in the book that bring this, brings this to life even more. So even more reason for you to check out the book when you have the chance. I'm Rochelle Diamond. I'm on our employee experience team and I have the privilege of running our LinkedIn speaker series, which is all about bringing in inspiring ideas, diverse, innovative thinkers, thinkers to, make to make you more you productive, more productive and, successful. and successful. And I think this, I think this, this speaker this series just pretty series much, pretty much that, hits nail that nail right on the head. Right on the head. So welcome, <laughs> welcome to the speaker series with Greg McCune. Greg is a speaker, a best-selling author, and the host of the podcast, What's Essential. Uh, he's been covered by the New York Times, Fast Company, Fortune, Political, Politico, and Inc. He's been interviewed on NPR, NBC, Fox, The Steve Harvey Show, and is among the most popular bloggers on this little website we know as, it's called LinkedIn. <laughs> Originally from London, England, he now lives in California with his wife, Anna, and their four children. And to add to the amazingness of this event, our very own Chrissy Roth Francis, Senior Manager in Talent Development, and another self-proclaimed huge Greg McCune fan is here to lead this engaging conversation. So get your pen and paper or your keyboards or whatever, ready to capture all the notes on this effortless goodness that's about to come your way. I'd also love to see any nuggets of wisdom that resonate with you along the way in the chat. Make sure to put those in as we go. So now let's give a big round of applause and warm welcome to Chrissy Roth Francis and Greg McEwen. Greg, hello, it's so good to see you. Welcome back to LinkedIn. Uh, thank you so much. I'm such a big supporter and fan of LinkedIn and everything that you're trying to do. And it's a pleasure to be with you, Christy. And thank you to uh, Christy and thank you to, uh, to Rochelle as well. Yes. Well, thank you for being here. Thank you for being so active on our platform. And I am so excited to have everybody learn the huge nuggets of wisdom that you're going to drop on all of us today. And, and I personally would love to thank you, Greg. So my, my pandemic activity, my self-improvement activity has been bike riding. I've picked up bike riding for the first time since I was a kid. And a couple months ago, I noticed my bike rides were getting longer and longer. And you, I have to thank for it because I was listening to you as on an audiobook, and I wanted to keep listening and listening. So because I was learning so much from you on your book as you, with you as a narrator, that I just kept biking. Amazing. So thank you. Yeah. I love it. I love it. That's like a the two for the price of one. I love it. What a there you go. <laughs> All right. Well, you know that at LinkedIn, we have this tradition. We like to ask rapid fire questions. So I want to start out asking yeah, you some, about yeah. Oh, it's going to be great. It's okay. It's okay. First question. You ready? Yes. All right. You talk about living in California's wine country, which is not at all far from where I live. 
So I got to know, Greg, if you had your own wine label, what would the name of the label be? Oh, my. Um, okay. I could see maybe given my, uh, given essentialism and, and everything, maybe essential spirits. Maybe, Ooh. maybe spirits. is that, is that all right? Do I get a I like it. I like the play on spirits right there. That is that is perfect. I had a feeling essential or effortless would be yeah. amazing. Spirits was the that was the the twist. You could, you could okay, call that's it great. Yeah, go on, go on. I love it. In your book, you talk about having fun when you're doing some things that aren't typically fun, like cleaning your house. So you all, you advise right. that we should start dancing and singing and having fun when we're doing not so fun activities. So you specifically talk about dancing to Disney songs with your kids while cleaning the house. What is your favorite Disney song? What's my favorite Disney song? Well, first of all, let me just say that, that there, there are people that when they hear that story of us tidying up and doing these Disney songs, my, my daughters put those on. Uh, they're like, yeah, I'm glad we're not in that family. You know, like it doesn't work for everybody. Uh, but, uh, but my favorite Disney song, well, I, I think I would have to go with something from the, from Beauty and the Beast. My, my wife was in the national tour of Beauty and the Beast for the first year of our marriage. So she was the understudy for Belle. Uh, and so I've wow. listened to that theatrical performance. I mean, really like, you know, certainly upwards of a hundred times, uh, but, you know, maybe, maybe hundreds now. And, uh, and there, there's a song in there that I have heard my wife sing many, many times uh, and it's called Home. So it's not part of the, it wasn't in the movie um, version. Uh, but it, but it's a, it's a very compelling, powerful song, actually. I think. I mean, it's, 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 uh, and and if our first year of marriage was spent traveling, uh, the you know North America in that tour, and so it has all these. I was just selling. I would sell, <laughs> I would sell the the uh, you know the roses at, at intermission. So uh, <laughs> I was at the very, very bottom of the totem pole, but absolutely delighted to be a part. It's of so it. good. Okay, so here I am thinking I can mimic you and I can go around the house and sing and dance and clean. I didn't know you actually have a, a singer and a dancer and an actor as, yeah. as a wife. So your your family just up leveled that entire <laughs> game. Okay. She I'm a has little intimidated a, now. Talent. I, I I take down the overall uh talent IQ, <laughs> if, you, if one can put it that way. All right, couple more questions, Greg. So right. I know you've traveled a lot for your book and it sounds like on your wife's tour as well. What's your favorite place to visit in North America? Oh, um, well, uh, we just came back from a place. Uh, Anna and I went to a place that uh, and I've stayed at, I've stayed at, you know, let's say hundreds of hotels around the, the around North America and around the world. And, and this was like my favorite place I've ever stayed. And it was, we were there just for like, I think three nights or something, but it was like, one of the only times I've ever been in a place where I said, I just don't even want to leave. And I mean, it's North America. It's in Mexico. Uh, in Cabo, it's a place called the one and only, which has a sort of essentialist ring to it anyway. Uh, but is, uh, but what a, what a beautiful place that was. So that's one place that comes to mind from recently. Yes. All right. I could do with a trip to Mexico very soon. Okay. Yeah. Last question before we get on with it. If you were not a best-selling author, what career would you be involved in oh what career um well the first career i ever wanted to be a part of and maybe i would just go back to my roots is uh, i wanted to be a jeweler um i used to i mean talking about like when i was five years old or whatever that i would uh i'd go i'd be shopping with my mother and we would go together and and and, and as we were going maybe I would be at the window. I was drawn to all these jewelry stores in, in Leeds, England, where I grew up. Uh, and, and something about that just always, always made me think I'd love to be in this business. So I may, maybe I'd go back to being, being a jeweler would be my, my alternative. So you can see, I better stay with the one I'm on. I, I quite <laughs> successful, the one you're on, but a jewel, a jeweler sounds quite exciting as well. It could be good. Couldn't it? You can, you can see a whole, a whole, you know, new vent it's a different kind of venture a different guy you got venture. it <laughs> well i love it thank you so much for those rapid fire answers and now greg i'm going to turn it over to you because we want to learn from you give us everything you know well that's good I mean, so it won't take long to give you everything i know i i just i've been thinking about all of you i've been thinking about you at linkedin about what 
your experience in life will have been over the last 18 months. I'm thinking, of course, about the April and in May when it first started happening and how that will have been discombobulating and uh, you know, suddenly you're, you know, we all have to go like uh, like teenagers sent to our rooms and experience a sort of involuntary essentialism. I'm thinking about the relentlessness that will have followed. Uh, yes, now maybe you're doing home education. It's affected all sorts of relationships and, and, and in fatiguing ways too. But the relentlessness that followed as the world digitized uh, in a hurry uh, and so there's a new demand for some of the, the services that LinkedIn provides. So suddenly I can imagine, uh, in a sense, a lot of success following that time period. Uh, I'm, I'm thinking about, you know, I, I've worked with LinkedIn for many years now in, in one way or another. Uh, and so I think I know something about the innovation cycles, about the relentlessness of that, uh, the, the, the continual improvement. I mean, all these things are good things. But they do, I think, all of this come together to create an experience. And, and maybe this is an exaggeration in order to make the point. But it seems to me there may only be two kinds of employees at, at uh, LinkedIn right now. Uh, there's, uh, there's a group that are burned out. And then there's a group that know they are burned out. Uh, and that's sort of the, you know, that's the, the range. It's better to be in the second category to at least be aware of it. Uh, but, but nevertheless, this is a challenge. And and so it seems to me, at least, I'm persuaded that, that what got you here you know, personally and in your teams, what got you to the level of success you're in won't get you there. And, and that's an important distinction because if we, I mean, you are all, just the fact that you're listening to this, the fact you're watching this, it, it, the, the fact that you're at LinkedIn, it means that if any group ever were a part of the hit squad, it's you right? HIT squad stands for the hardworking, intelligent, talented group of people that you are. And with that, there are some tremendous advantages. But one of the disadvantages is that you tend to try to solve problems in certain ways, by pushing harder, by powering through, by pivoting, by working, as can be 24-7 kind of experience, especially if you're working on a global team and this sort of thing. And so all of this uh, is something we have to handle. We have to figure out how to go forward. Uh, and, and what I really want to do today, maybe just as we get going here, is to share three counterintuitive things that you can do right now to be able to break through to the next level, but without burning out. And then we're going to open it up to some Q&A. We'll get Chrissy back here uh, after we've shared these you know, three specific things. And, and if we have time, maybe opening up to, to other questions coming in from, from all of you as well. Okay, let's get to this. The, the, let me ask you this question. Who here can, wants to work? You know, no, let's say it this way. Who would like to achieve better results, even 10x results? Yeah, this, is, this is a no-brainer, right? It, it's, it's everybody here. And if we were together, we would actually be able to see that uh, and, 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 and experience that together. Okay, who here can work 10 times harder? Right. Yeah, maybe there's one or two of you that can, right? But, but, but maybe not, probably not. And so in those two questions, you see a dilemma, right? You want to have better results, but you can't work 10 times harder. So, so, and if you try to achieve 10x results by working 10x harder, then what happens is you will burn out. And for many people now, uh, you know, th th there are people who are teetering right on the edge of burnout. Uh, there are people that will be listening right now who want to make this higher contribution, but lack the energy to do so. There will be people, surely, maybe all of us, who are experiencing times when everything seems harder than it needs to be. And if any of that sounds true for you, then, then, then the three specific things I'm going to get to, I think, will have the power of relevancy. So let's get to them. Number one um, is to invert. Uh, to invert. Um, inversion, of course, means to see something in the opposite direction. And insecure overachievers have basically been rewarded for one way of thinking about performance and about results. So they, they've been rewarded for pushing harder, for exerting, for doing more, 
for taking on more responsibility and so on. And that's what got you here. But what I want to encourage you to do is to invert that completely, to ask a completely different question. Uh, let, let, let's give an example. Uh, I was coaching somebody, when, uh, definitely a member of the HIT squad. She works at a university. She's in the staff there. And she's the kind of person who's up till 4 a.m. in the morning, photoshopping for a youth activity the next day, volunteer work. No one's expecting her to do that, but she just thinks the only way to increase performance is to increase exertion. So she feels guilty if she even eats lunch. Because again, same logic. It's a certain pattern. That's a certain paradigm, a mindset. And, and she's, you know, built you know, a whole world around that assumption. And it's keeping her back from a higher contribution. So I coached her. I said, okay, next time you have to invert it. You have to ask an opposite question. It's a bit like uh, George Casanza right in, uh, in, in Seinfeld. Do you remember that classic episode where he, he does the opposite, does the opposite of what he always thinks. He's been a failure in the past. He, he does all the opposite and suddenly everything works out for him. Well, in a similar way, as an overachiever, I want you to see the opposite way of thinking about it. Don't, not work harder to achieve more results, but how can you make it easier to achieve results? It's a very different kind of mindset. And I said this to her to do this. And so she gets a call from one of the other, a professor at the university. He said, oh, I want you to come and video my class for the semester. Now, among her responsibilities, she has a videography team. And so she's just ready, you know, like she's overachiever, wants to a perfectionist, an overthinker. So she goes, okay, I know what to do. And she's about to just jump in. We'll get a whole team of videographers there, multiple camera angles. We'll have, we'll, we'll edit it all together. We'll add some music at the beginning and at the end. We'll add graphics and slides. We'll just, I'm going to wow him. And then she remembers the coaching, invert. How can you make this effortless? And so she says, okay, well, who is this for? Let me just explore for a minute with you. And it turns out that uh, it's for one student who's going to miss just a few classes. And so the solution she comes up with there on the phone is, well, what if you just have another student record it on their iPhone and then send it whenever he happens to miss for this athletic commitment? Well, the professor's delighted, hangs up the phone, and she can't believe it. Ten minutes she's been on this phone. Ten minutes. And it saved four months of work for her and a whole team of people uh, that she would have otherwise done. And in fact, the, the, the solution was better than the one that she would have provided. It would have met the need more precisely. So there's an example. I mean, what, what does this look like for you? I mean, let's just get to the mindset point for a second. A lot of overachievers tend to think that not only is hard work good and a virtue, which it is, but also learn to distrust the easy. And so here's a mantra for you, which is easy does not equal lazy. That's a good mantra. Easy does not equal lazy. But also to ask this question, not just how can this be easy, which is one thing to ask, but also, this is a bit killer, how, can, how am I making this harder than it needs to be? You put that question up, take that question with you, and you find there's so many ways that you're overthinking and overexerting and overengineering and overcomplicating and over, uh, you know, uh, overexerting. And those things don't continually lead to higher performance. They often lead to plateauing or failing altogether. All right. Number two is to limit, uh, to, to limit in order to become limitless. Uh, I'm thinking here of a, of, of a case study uh, in Sweden. I'm headed to Sweden here in a, in, a, in a couple of weeks, and I was doing some research on it. And one of the, the unbelievable case studies in Swedish history is of the, of, of the king of Sweden decided that he wanted to build a great ship. Uh, this is like this is like a nightmarish a project management uh, scenario here. He wants to build this great ship, uh, the greatest vessel that's ever been built in the whole region and impress all of the people around him, uh, all the other VIPs. And so he, 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 he gets everything right in a sense, but he doesn't do one thing. And that is he never defines what done looks like. And so he just keeps on changing his mind along the way. And at first, it's going to be 100 feet long, then 130, then 160 feet long. And at one time, it's going to be just cannons along the edge. And then eventually, it becomes two sets of cannons. Uh, and then in a completely 
a frivolous addition. He adds 700 sculptures to be added to this ship. It's so, so trivial. Uh, and, and this, well, eventually, he goes on for so long. It costs so much money. Eventually, it kills. It's said to have killed the shipbuilder uh, through a heart attack when one of these change orders comes in. When all we, we, and, and the day comes, not for the completion of the ship, but of showing it off. He's invited all the VIPs from Scandinavia to be there, and they bring the ship out for its maiden voyage. It's still not been tested. They still haven't figured out what Dunn looks like. And, and, and they, they, they bring this thing out. They have all the cannons out because they're going to do some gun salute for these, uh, for these uh, guests. And a, a gust of wind pull, comes over, pulls the ship, and pulls it into the water, just pull, tilts it over. And the cannons all suddenly fill up with water. Water comes into the deck, and within one hour of its maiden voyage, quite tragically as it turns out, it goes to the bottom of the ocean. 50-plus uh, sailors die, and this, this hasn't even... The most expensive ship in, 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 in Swedish history uh, has, uh, has, has gone not even one mile uh, before, before it sank. And, and in that story is something about modern day life where we don't put boundaries on things, where we don't define what done looks like. A simple idea. It's not like we haven't heard about it, but you simply can't complete a project until you've identified what done looks like. And, and you'll multiply all sorts of complexity until you have that precision answer. Uh, and, and you can apply this principle, of course, to your own life too. I mean, who here, who here hasn't lived a kind of Zoom, eat, sleep, repeat life uh, over this last 18 months, where whatever remaining boundaries used to exist between work at home are gone. Uh, and, and you, you know, because maybe you had to drive to work, maybe you had to, 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 to drive to the headquarters or to be with your team. At least you had some physical, uh, you know, division. But then with the total digitization of our lives, I mean, you look at your Fitbit at the end of the day and it literally says 300 steps. I mean, am I exaggerating or is this, you know, actually the experience that we have with this? And, and, and the, you know, that sensation where you've been constantly doing things all day in a sort of fatiguing way, but you, when you lie down in bed at night, your to-do list is now longer than it was at the beginning of the day. And you have that sensation of like, oh, my goodness, look at all I haven't done. And the stress can be there with you. And, and that's that's basically the, the, you know, the Vasa is the name of this ship from Sweden. It's like the Vasa strategy in your life. It's like there's never a done point. And so I would encourage you to have boundaries. Uh, and, and one of those boundaries is to set, create a done for the day list. You actually take a few minutes. Ten minutes is probably sufficient to just make a plan for the day. And how as obvious as that sounds, what I have found, a little to my surprise and chagrin, is that people just aren't doing this. Many, many people are just living out of their inboxes. And yes, they'll make, they'll make lists as they go along in the day and even cross items off and so on, but there is no sense of, when I have completed these things, I can be done. Anna, my wife and I, will, we talk about like, once we're done for the day, no sneaky work, right? Like you can't, no, I'm just going to buy a few more things on Amazon. No, you know, I'll just check a few more emails here and respond to them. It's like, we're done. We need to recuperate. We need to be able to rest so that we can slingshot into the next day. And boundaries need to happen in a boundaryless world. All right, the third thing is pace. Is pace. Oh, listen here. Maybe you heard this story, but I've gone back and read the original sort of accounts of, of, of an extraordinary adventure. It was in the great age of exploration in 1800s when everybody wanted, it was like it captured the imagination, certainly of the explorer com community, but also of people at large. Who will be the first person to ever get to the South Pole? Because no one had ever done it before. No one had done it in, a, in, in, in all recorded history. Not the Vikings in all of their, you know, in a thousands of years of, of traveling the, the whole, all the seas, not the British Empire and all its prowess. No one had ever done it. And, and, and who will be the first? And there have been lots of failed attempts that have made it into the media and so on. But finally, these two teams are setting off. They set off at the same time to compete to be the first. The first group is a British group and they, uh, their, their approach 
uh, among other things, they, they took what I would call now a boom and bust approach to execution. Uh, so what does that look like? On the good weather days, they pushed themselves completely to the edge of exhaustion and maybe beyond. What's the maximum we can do? 30 miles, 40 miles, maybe under the right conditions, you could do even 50 miles. And they, they, what they didn't mean to do was that it meant that on the bad weather days, they had no, no energy left and they would try to make progress. They could not even hardly make an inch of progress. So they'd end up spending all of the day in the tent, lots of time on their hands to be grumpy about it all, to complain about their bad luck and so on. One journal entry says, I can't imagine anyone being able to make progress in weather conditions like this. But one team could, and that was the Norwegian team. The Norwegian team, the expedition leader, had a different rule. He said 15 miles. On the good weather days, we're going 15 miles. On the bad weather days, we're going to go as close as we can to 15 miles. We're going to be consistent. Consistency is like, uh, this is the thing that is so kind of challenging for humans. We, we tend to be so... Uh, you, you know, hot and cold. We tend to, to try to push things to our limit and beyond, and then, and then we sort of give up for a while. Well, this team says 15 miles per day, every day, every day. And this is what they're doing, consistent progress, but the plot thickens. They get within 45 miles of the South Pole. They have perfect weather conditions. It's perfect sledding conditions. One big full push will get them over the line. They can do it in one day. So what do they do? What would you do? What would I do? I mean, you know, I, I, I know what I'd do. I, even, even though I know sort of this case study, and even though I'm arguing for, uh, for this idea of pace, I mean, the temptation would be too great. You just do it. Just go. You don't even know where your competitor team is. Maybe they're ahead of you. Maybe they're just behind you. And you, you just push, but he doesn't. He says, no, we're gonna, he averages again 15 miles a day for the next three days. Well, they arrive before the British team, so they win. They have beaten the British team by 30 plus days. And then that's not, that's counterintuitive. That's not what overachievers believe about success and performance and high performance. We believe that if you push to your limit, you're going to make it faster, but actually that's not what happens. It's what we think should happen. It's even what we've been taught to happen, but it isn't what happens. Not only do they beat the British team by, so, uh, by such a margin, they also have such a steadiness of pace. They're able to have enough health to make the journey back home, 16,000 mile journey back to Norway. This is non-trivial achievement because the British team don't. They're so demoralized and they're so exhausted by the time they get there. They're so burned out not one of them survive the journey home. There's cataclysmic strategy, as it turns out. If you go back and read the biography, uh, this is called Race to the Poles. It's superbly written. And the biographer chooses three words to describe the progress made by the Norwegian team. And just listen to these words. It's unbelievable. It's unfathomable to me. He says they made their progress, quote, without particular effort. Without particular effort. I mean, this thing is the, the, the most arduous physical test that people can even imagine at that time. This thing is on the edge. In fact, it is conceivably impossible. And yet they achieved it without particular effort. What does it even mean? How could you even make such a statement? And yet this is the phrase he uses to describe their pace. They paced themselves. And what we can do as well is to do the same. We can set boundaries. Set up a boundaries in your performance. When you set a goal to achieve something, have an upper bound. Have a lower bound so that you make progress every day, but also have an upper bound so that you leave something in the tank for tomorrow, so that you leave something in the tank for something that might come up that's very unexpected, that makes tomorrow, you know, a sort of bad weather day, so to speak. And so that you want that consistency uh, day in and day out. A rule you can use that you can adopt from now on that I think is relevant, and, I, and I'll leave you on this before we before we get to, you know back to, uh, with with Chrissy for some some additional questions, uh, is is don't do more today than you can completely recover from by tomorrow. Right, that's the idea. Now you could do it. You could do it. You could say, well, don't do more this week than you can completely recover from this week. And that gives you a little more 
you know, adaptability to, to changing circumstances. But if you violate that rule over time, the probability that you will burn out is very high. And unfortunately, the chance that you'll be burning out without even knowing it is also high because the very nature of burnout is that it creates a sort of foggy brain. It makes it hard for us to perceive things clearly, including our self-awareness. So often the people that are, that are most exhausted, most burned out are the last to know about it. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and really, um, that's no good to anyone. You know, that's no good to you. That's no good to people around you. Uh, what I want, I'm sure what LinkedIn wants, and, and, and I'm confident it's what you want, is to break through to a higher point of contribution, but in a way you don't burn out, in a way that you can keep on contributing, not for a season, not for a quarter, not for a week or a day, but for decades, for the next 30, 40 years, that you can continue to make a contribution, even crescendo in your contribution, to live your life in crescendo, rather than just plateau and start to fail altogether. Well, to me, to me, this, uh, this, it matters. To me, this is important. And these are, you know, some of my, you know, first thoughts uh, for you as I've been thinking about you. Okay, so with that, I think Chrissy's coming and joining me. Uh, and we'll get Craig, to some, get some other questions. Wow. Thank you so much. I was taking so many notes. Again, I've read the book and I was still taking notes because I can't get enough of this information. And you're, you're right. We, we are burnt out. Whether we know it or not, we are burnt out. That is what the pandemic has done to so many people if we were not already burnt out. So I really appreciate hearing your tips on inversion, limiting, and pacing. So important. Now, I wanted to, to move along a little bit. I, I, for a few years, lived in Los Angeles where I met many actors who were living off residuals. They did a commercial or a movie one time, and then they got the residuals in their bank account every single month. And I was quite jealous of that. Yeah. You talk about residual decision-making right. and making one decision and reaping the rewards of that forever. Can you tell us more about this? I love this concept. Yeah, well, effortlessness taken to its ultimate conclusion is that you get a result with putting in no effort. Right. I mean, that's like that's pure effortlessness is that maybe you put in effort up front, maybe even more effort up front to build something that then returns rewards to you, you know, even literally while you're sleeping. Linear result is one where you get a result, but you have to put the effort in today and tomorrow you're going to have to put in the effort again and the next day again. And so you get a result, but only when you're putting in the effort right there and then residual results are a complete game changer. And it's not like it's a totally new concept, but what I, or even a new concept at all, but what I've observed as I've worked with people is that they often uh, have a ratio that's not great, that most of the results they're getting, they're getting just because today they pushed for this thing, today they had to make it happen. And so they're never really getting ahead. They're just repeating the same thing right now. Uh, and, and so, so like, let's use an example about this. One of my favorites, uh, one of my friends um, uh, is, uh, you know, went to, uh, to Africa with her then husband, and she was uh, trying to make a difference to the people there, especially people that were in subsistence level uh, entrepreneurs. And she met one that was making, you know, selling produce, you know, at the roadside, and this is allowing her to live her children enough just to eat. But if she's ever not there for one day, then they don't eat and she doesn't eat. So she can't get ahead and she can't afford to leave the situation. And they want to help her. And they figure out that if they were to give her $500, she has, will have enough time to be able to get out of her work, you know, her day, you know, being there on the, you know, on the roadside, and actually go and renegotiate contracts with the, the original uh, providers of the produce she's selling and cut out the middleman. And, and that would allow her to become more profitable and to start getting ahead in her business. She could work on her business rather than just in her business. Right. So that's like sort of level one. And they think, well, we can get five hundred dollars to do this. We can help her with this. And then they were inspired by Muhammad Yunus to say, well, hold on. What if we could do, uh, you know, what if we provided as a loan to her? Not so we get our money back, but so that it could be used again and again and again. 
and help other entrepreneurs in a similar situation. So that's already leverage, right? That's already a residual result if they can achieve that level. And then as they're thinking through that, they say, hold on, hold on. What if we could leverage one more level? What if we could create a website where other like-minded people like us, but maybe people that aren't, you know, can't spend six months traveling around and looking for people to help in Africa as we've just done. And, and this is how Kiva.org was born. So they could have given $500 one time. They could have given a loan. Okay, that maybe let's call that, I don't know, 2X or 10X contribution because of how many times it'd be repeated. Or they could go to this next level up where, I mean, $500 versus what's now been $1.3 billion in, uh, in, in, in loans that are repaid at the 97% mark. So this is just residual goodness and residual impact and residual influence. And, and, and if they, if they, when they're sleeping, people all over the world are still investing and helping. And this continues to grow and the momentum is, is, is amazing. That's, I don't know what you call that. It's not just 10 X. It's a, I mean, that's beyond a thousand X impact. And, and that's, one of the examples that gets me so excited about the difference, because in the moment when we're thinking about how to get a result, we tend to think, oh, let's, I'll just do it myself, or I'll just do this this one time. But if you, if you add up the cost of that over time, you may be making a, a, a fool's bargain, you know, because yes, right now, only a few minutes to solve this problem you know, only $500 to solve the problem right now. But actually, over time, you will spend a great deal more effort to get the results that you want, where a, a different kind of thinking and a different kind of investment can return to you a tremendously, uh, you know, great, not just return on investment, not just ROI, but ROE, return on effort. Yes, it's such a it's such a great mindset shift. I also think about return on investment, and this has taken it to so many more levels, the idea of leverage and, and bringing in the residual results. I, I absolutely love it. Thank you, Greg. Another thing you, you talk about a lot in your book, of course, is simplifying. And when I think about simplifying, I think about how do we streamline steps? How do we make sure we are all aligned? But when you talk about simplifying, you're talking about getting rid of the steps. Talk to us more about how can we truly simplify in order to become effortless? Yes. I mean, look, there's, there's, there's different ways of thinking about simplification. Uh, and, and, you know, you, you can, well, I interviewed um, Mike Evangelist, uh, that's his real name, uh, when he was working, this is like, you know, go back years ago when DVD burning was brand new. And if you wanted to buy a DVD burning machine at that time, it might cost you thirty thirty five thousand dollars $35,000 to get one. The very industry specific um, business. And Steve Jobs is by this point has come back to Apple. And so he wants to put DVD burning software as standard on the new Mac. And so Apple goes and purchases this, uh, this DVD burning company. They bring them in and they're given two weeks to simplify uh, their, their, their software. It's got all these different features. It's got all of these different you know, bells and whistles. And in fact, they, it was, came complete, their software, with a 1,000-page manual for how to use it, right? So you can sort of sense that it's, you know, yes, it might have lots of functionality, but it's also immensely complex and, and, and going to be a, a, an obstacle for people. So they have two weeks, and they just start taking all that complexity and removing item by item by item and so on. And they become really proud of what they're going to show to Steve. And uh, they've got their presentation ready. And Steve comes in. And, and before they get to go through everything, he walks up to the whiteboard. He says, I've been thinking a lot about this. And he draws this rectangle. And he said, what we're going to do is uh, we're going to have this one button here. It says burn. You drag your file into, this, into the box. And you click burn. That's the app we're going to build. That's everything. This is the birth of uh, IDVD. And in that moment, Mike said that he's in that he's in the room and they're all suddenly, first of all, embarrassed about their presentation, which they never give. They're suddenly like, OK, well, that's way, way more complicated than, than, than what he's just come up with. But he said it was worth the embarrassment because he learned a simple principle on simplification forever afterwards. And that was this. You start with zero. A lot of us, maybe even maybe most or all of us just about Think of simplification as take all the complexity and start to pull away pieces of the complexity. 
But if you do it from the other extreme, if you just start with nothing and you start asking yourself the question, you know, like, what, how can we do this in one click? How can we achieve the result in a, a one step, you know, solution? It's what Amazon did as well under Jeff Bezos or in a dissimilar time uh, that he says, okay, look, I'm not looking for 50 steps for, uh, for the checkout process. That's how it was. And that's how all e-commerce was at the time. Uh, he says, he says, uh, he said, look, can we do it in one click? How do we set it up so that people can check out? And, what, and that's how one click purchasing was bought, born at, at, at Amazon. That's this 20 year advantage. They had that protected. Uh, and you could say, well, that's not fair. But, uh, but, but in a sense, it is because it takes a different mindset, a different way of thinking about simplification to even think that way. And so that's 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 what I'd encourage people to do. I mean, it, it's you know, how can I solve this in a one click solution? How can I completely automate this or completely delegate this or uh, or just, you know, build a system with a checklist that, that just gets followed without having to think about it? It's, it's all about how do you do it in one step rather than how to simplify the many steps you already have. Greg, I feel like so much of what you're teaching us is flipping everything we've ever learned upside down. It, 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 that inversion idea. It's everything yes. we've been groomed to think and to act our work ethic. You're saying throw it out the window. I have a whole new ball game for you. And it's it's incredibly refreshing to hear. So thank you. I, I would be remiss if I didn't mention that in your book, you do talk about our founder, Reed Hoffman. You yes. quote him. So at one point, Reed says, I have come to learn that part of the business strategy is to solve the simplest easiest and most valuable problem. And then you talk about how finding the tiny efforts produce massive results. How do we spot these, these problems and then get to those massive results? Yeah. I mean, first of all, let's just, just back up for a second with, with Reed about this. I mean, you know, there's no, there's no LinkedIn without Reed Hoffman. We know that that's true. And it, obviously he wasn't the only person involved in that, but there's no, there's just, just doesn't even exist. And, and part of the reason it exists is because he didn't try to take on everything. He had a, a clear idea, a simple idea. And, and, and he said, look, software actually he makes the point that software is a lot easier than hardware. And that's one of the reasons he, he did this. He's always impressed and, uh, you know, by, by Apple and by HP and those that are, that are you know, building uh, you know, the, the physical stuff because it's so hard. And he's like, we don't have to go down that path. We can, we can just find a way to create a service that, that itself, uh, it, you know, we can do it and it, we, we can have the courage to be rubbish at first. Uh, you know, famously, uh, Reed talks about this, that if you're not embarrassed about the first software that you launch, then you launch too late. Uh, and so he's encouraging that. So so I think one of the things I would say, I mean, you can create a two by two quite easily uh, that, that would help you at least start to evaluate ideas, right? One axis is hard versus easy. And the other is, you know, like essential versus non-essential. So essential, what, what you're looking for, I mean, first of all, you want to eliminate everything that's hard and non-essential, right? That's just complete waste of your energies or complete waste of your time. Uh, and, and it's this complex stuff that you're, you're, you're fighting your way through. And, and, and sometimes that's a bit of a counterintuitive thing to, to realize actually the wise, smart thing to do is not to, it, the courageous thing to do is not to keep fighting the wrong battle, is to let it go and move on to some, you know, to move on to something else. You're looking explicitly for the things that are as easy as possible, that are as essential as possible, and start there. You can always move from that to the essential things that are, you know, currently seem harder. And you can use some of these strategies from Effortless to maybe rethink how you're approaching those things you assume to be hard and find an easier strategy. But to, that's, that's what you, the criteria you're looking for. Which things are you doing that are easy, uh, but also you think they'll be easy and, and, and also uh, essential? I think, that's, I think that's a good way to do it. And then, and then not overcomplicate it actually have the courage to be rubbish about it. Like just start, you know, let's just, we're going to just start and, and get going on this. Have the courage to be rubbish about it. it it's <laughs> such a foreign concept for me and I really appreciate hearing it from you. All right. One, one last question for you, Greg, you have hundreds of people here from LinkedIn. We are here to learn how to embody essentialism and being effortless. 
What is your last really quick piece of advice for us? Oh, last piece of advice. Um, okay, my last piece of advice is a bonus, um, is radical gratitude. Yes, yeah, I feel good about that. Uh, I, I, I learned in the, the hardest experience of my life, and by the way, you don't write a book on effortless because you think life is easy, right? There's no point in doing that. You write it because life is so hard for so many people almost all the time. That's why you write it. Life is full of challenge and suffering. And so, you know, what, what, what do we live for? I'm quoting now. Uh, what do we live for if not to make life uh, less difficult for each other? You know, and, and in the midst of the, one of the most difficult, if not the most difficult challenge of my whole life, when my daughter went from being the picture of health to suddenly having what was undiagnosed but looked a lot like uh, Parkinson's disease, but she's a 14-year-old you know, teenager, uh, and I'm in the midst of that. They can't give me any diagnosis. Anna and I are like meeting with neurologists all the time to try to make sense of it. Uh, you, we just, her personality is gone. Her, her, her communication abilities are gone. Uh, she, she's, she's right whole, right hand side of her body isn't working. And, and in the midst of all of that discovered, uh, the, the, uh, the unbelievable, it's it's almost impossible to to overstate the 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 tenacity and power of radical gratitude um gratitude is not something that's just a sort of nice to have thing that goes on top of everything else it's causative it will change your state almost instantly it will then because your state is changed change the action you take your, even your options will change your sense of your options will change. Your relationships will change. Your capability will increase, which prepares you for the next set of challenges, whatever those are going to be. Radical gratitude is, um, let's say it this way. This is what I learned. If, like, when you, if you focus on what you lack, you're going to lose what you have. And if you focus on what you have, you will gain what you lack. I mean, what you focus on, you get more of. And at the first, it was so tempting to focus on all the problems and the things we couldn't do anything about. We, we could have easily, and the temptation was there to become very victimized by this. You know, well, you know, why Eve? And it's so unfair. And what about why us? And, and, and this shift... To, to radical gratitude was it just had this immediate effect in our family culture and in, in our relationships and helped us to be able to work with neurologists and, and various people over the next what turned out to be a two year journey longer than we imagined at the beginning, I suppose, uh, you know, sustainably to be able to maintain that under these circumstances. And as of this conversation, as of this moment, um, my daughter is is uh, is well. She is better. She is herself again. She is back. And we're, of course, of course, grateful for that uh, and grateful for the whole journey. Uh, let me give it into one final specific thing people can do is this. And, and they need to do it. If I'm just so blunt about it, you need to do it at LinkedIn, because if you're ungrateful at LinkedIn, and I'm not saying everything's perfect and nothing's ever perfect anywhere. But if you're not grateful at LinkedIn, that then. And that doesn't mean you have to stay there forever either. But if you're not grateful there, you're not going to be grateful anywhere. I mean, I've worked with a lot of toxic organizations and LinkedIn isn't one of them. Of course, there'll be problems. There could be a toxic team here or there. But, but as a company, it's a healthy company. And, and so to, to, if we're not grateful now, when are we going to be grateful? So here's the rule. After I complain, I will say one thing I am thankful for. That's it. Uh, you do that. If you even improve your ratio to 50-50, it will have a, an immediate and causative effect effect and, and make everything, whatever you're doing, a little more effortless. Well, Greg, I have radical gratitude to you. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for sharing your wisdom, your story. I'm so happy to hear your daughter is doing better. I can only imagine what that must have been Thank like you. for you and your family. And I so appreciate having you as part of our LinkedIn speaker series. I know by the chat, by all the people here, they are loving what you were talking about. We are going to be reaping the knowledge of, of this talk for many, many years to come. Thank you for being here. Everybody at LinkedIn, thank you 
so much for joining us. Please keep coming back to all of our future LinkedIn speaker series. It is wonderful having you here. And again, I am so grateful to Greg and I'm so grateful to LinkedIn for the opportunity that we get to come here, listen to these amazing people and authors to fulfill our lives and keep us going. Thank you, everybody. Have a fantastic day. Stay self, stay safe, stay healthy, and let's uh, let's drive to effortless. Let's drive it. Thank you.